as promised, I'm going to give you everything you need to know about how to build a perfect credit score. Pretty much the exact same thing that took me from a small town kid from Milwaukee, Wisconsin in 2005, moving to Las Vegas, you know, uh, at one point being homeless, working odd and in jobs, uh, having a vehicle repossessed. Uh, you know, I can remember at one point uh, renting an apartment or it was actually renting a room out of an apartment. Uh, the bedroom was the size of a closet, a sleeping closet, uh, and I slept on a cot. But, you know, it was, it was information is what separated me or propelled me to be in a position to now build a multi-million dollar company in under three years. I'm going to give you that information here today. You know, so one of the things that I've always learned is that there's such a huge misconception about credit. You know, we don't understand it. It's not being taught in schools, uh, you know. Uh, our grandparents used to tell us credit was taboo, <laughs> you know, so hopefully by the end of this, you know, we'll be able to not only dispel some of those kind of taboos and myths that, you know, you may have grown up or heard and different things like that, but, but educate you to let you know that, you know, credit could be a good thing. You know, credit has pretty much runs the world. I mean, currently right now, you can't get a decent job without them running your credit score. Your insurance rates, they're running your credit score. Obviously, to buy a home, to buy a house, uh, an automobile, or whatever the case, even to rent an apartment, they're going to run your credit score. So, you know, I, I really want you to just dive in and take heed to this information that I'm about to share with you, because it's not only been life-changing for me, but it's changed the entire trajectory of my entire family, being able to, to help families all across the country purchase their first home purchase that first automobile without a co-signer, be able to get that credit card that they've always wanted, to be able to start that business. You know, so I, I don't want you to take what I'm about to share with you for vain or for granted, because this information has changed lives all across the country. You know, uh, I can remember uh, prior to moving to Las Vegas, I had a mentor who taught me. He said, well, eventually credit will become the new dollar. Of course, I didn't know what that meant at the time. But, you know, once I got to Las Vegas, I quickly found out. Couldn't get an apartment by myself. Of course, I had to call home and ask relatives to co-sign for a vehicle. Here I am, 20-plus years old, asking someone to co-sign for a vehicle, and I'm calling myself a man. So I knew I had to do something. You know, I got sick and tired of being sick and tired. And so what I was able to do was find out that the reason all of these things were happening was my credit. You know, you, it, it's hard to have a, a, a decent life a good lifestyle without a solid credit score and understanding credit is so much more than just being able to purchase things, but it also puts, it positions you to be in position to, to, to live life a little bit differently. Did you know that credit can indirectly determine the school zone that your kids go to school in? Did you know credit can determine whether you can get student loans or not for you parents who are trying to get ready to send your kids to college? Did you know credit is now starting to be used as a, as a barometer for, you know, life insurance companies? They're trying to figure out a way to, 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 to leverage credit as a means for someone to get approved for life insurance. And we all know and we, we, we see all of the, the detrimental things that happen when someone in a family doesn't have access to proper life insurance. We're doing GoFundMes and different things like that. But understanding that if you had that good credit, not only you know, would that not be an issue, but if you did need to leverage your credit to be able to send your family out on a proper burial, you, you would be able to do so. You know, to be able to, to well, as I always say, at minimum, you should have access to at least $10,000 worth of credit at your disposal. It's just in case of credit, as I call it, because you know, we understand life happens. You know, life happened to me many times throughout my journey uh, when I moved to Las Vegas. You know, being able to uh, determine whether, you know, I can uh, have any extracurricular activities, go to the movies or different things like that. Because, you know, one of the things that I vastly started to learn in my quest in, 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 in rebuilding my own personal credit is that people view you and respect you a little bit differently. You know, when you walk into a dealership with an 800 credit score, you're now Mr. Roundtree. <laughs> you know, uh, they're, they're asking you, hey, what, what else can I give you? And believe it or not, they're throwing in things, uh, free car mats, free you know, car washes for life or whatever the case is, because they want you to be a repeat customer. 
from a, a, a purchasing a home standpoint, when it's whether it's a residential pro, uh, residency, you're going to get the best rates. You know, uh, whether you're a real estate investor, you're trying to start a business. Matter of fact, as a business owner, for all my entrepreneurs out there, your credit is the lifeline to your business. You know, you're always going to have to leverage your credit in some form of capacity. You know, you want to go out there and start that restaurant. Guess what? You're going to need what? A building. To get that building, what are you going to have to do? You're going to have to provide them your personal guarantor of what your credit looks like in order to even qualify for that building. And this is just to lease it. You're not even trying to buy it. You know, so understand that credit is so much more than the taboo things that people have taught us about. You know, you know, around my household, we were taught that credit cards were bad. They're the devil and, you know, all these different things. But one of the things that I learned is that uh, having access to a checking account could be bad. I know people that's burnt every single bank in a city that they live in, they had to move to the next town. <laughs> so it's not that the credit cards are bad, it's people who are irresponsible. And a lot of it just has to boil down to we weren't taught these things. We weren't taught these principles. You know, they say what separates the wealthy from the unwealthy is information. But then not only that information, you want to apply that information. So hopefully you're going to apply everything that I'm about to dive into right here about, you know, how to get the perfect credit score. So now the first thing that you want to do is, and before I jump into it, you want to get out of denial. <laughs> you know, I, I talk to so many people across the country who are scared to look at their credit reports. You know, I know people who, who uh, you know, tap into the underworld, if you understand what I'm saying, and they're more afraid to look at their credit report than the street life. You know, I, I, I know people who conquered and, and done all types of things that are on most people's bucket list, but they're scared to look at their credit. And I understand it can be it, it, it can be, you know, scary. It can be daunting. It can be intimidating, mainly because it's foreign to a lot of us. You know, there's no class in school that teaches you about credit. You know, I find it unbelievable that you can get a quarter of a million dollars in student loan money, but you can't get a ten thousand dollar business loan. You know, so this is the information that, you know, I'm going to give you today the information that's changed my life and the people's lives around me. So I hope you're locked in. I hope you have your pens and pads. And as they say, a short pencil is better than a long memory, but in my case, a marker. <laughs> so let's go ahead and hop into this. So how to build a perfect credit score. So understand that Credit is really just a three-digit number that pretty much dictates our lives. You know, uh, 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 the other thing that I really want people to know is that, you know, understanding that credit doesn't have to be scary. And a lot of it just has to do with is because we don't know how to use it. We don't understand the purpose of it for. So going back to understanding one of the first steps of what I had to do, which it took me two years to position myself for this information. So everything that it took me two years to do, I'm about to give you right now. So you guys are kind of getting the cheat notes of, 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 of what positioned me to be in a position that I'm in, to build a multi-million dollar company, all off leveraging perfect credit. So pulling your credit score, one of the very first places that you want to do. Well, one of the very first things that you want to do. Now understand, a lot of people don't know that the three different credit bureaus, these are three different entities. Well, first of all, let's, let's break down credit bureau. A credit bureau is not a government agency. And believe it or not, a lot of people think that. They don't have any jurisdiction or, 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 or any rights from a, a legality standpoint uh, in relations to government relations. All they do is they house and sell our information. Did you know credit bureaus make billions of dollars a day off of our information? So pretty much all there is a, is a data dump. They're a hub for our information. So for those who don't know, there are three different credit bureaus. You have Experian. You have Equifax. And then you have TransUnion. Three different credit repositories, three different parts of the country. Now, the reason this is extremely important is because I want people to understand you can have a 700 credit score on Experian, a 600 credit score on Equifax, and a 500 credit score on TransUnion. True story. I actually seen this, believe it or not. 
And you may ask, why is that the case? Well, because these three do not talk to each other, they're not related to each other in any shape, form, or fashion, but what happens is, is when you go out and get credit, the creditors, they have the right to send the information of your payment history to any one of these. So they may not report everything to all three bureaus. They may only report to two credit bureaus. Or let's say you're on the latter end of that and you have an account that goes to debt or goes to collections. That collection agency may not report to all three bureaus. They may only report to two of them. They may only report to one. So understanding, and the reason I point that out is because, you know, there's a lot of places where you can go and check your credit, but understanding that you want to make sure that you go and pull a comprehensive report, a three-in-one credit report. A three-in-one credit report is going to give you a breakdown and a composite uh, overview of all three of these credit scores, all three of the different credit repositories to see the information that they're reporting. The reason that's important, the last thing you want to do is you're at the closing table getting ready to close on that beautiful first home that you're about to purchase, and then something pops up on your Equifax and they pull your Equifax score. So again, one of the things about having access to credit monitoring, which is what I recommend, and that's the only way you're going to get your credit reports, is that it's an investment. You know, what if it did cost you 30 bucks? I mean, if it cost me 300 bucks a month, I would pay for that to have a peace of mind. We pay for things every single day that brings us zero return on our investment. How many of us are paying for cable television? I spoke to a client. He said his, his cable bill was $350 a month. And I said, that's to watch television? <laughs> so, you know, we pay for things all the time. We need to understand that getting access to our credit information is really just an investment. You know, now also understand, a lot of times people ask, well, how do I get my free credit score? You get what you pay for, you know? So in this case, you want to go out and invest and get an actual report that's going to give you all the information because there are some free uh, reporting agencies or credit monitoring services out there. But keep in mind, those are just consumer reports. When you're looking to position yourself for any type of financing, whether you're trying to buy that house, whether you're trying to uh, lease that vehicle or whatever the case is, you want to pull an actual FICO score. To pull that FICO score, yes, you will have to pay for that. So again, let's not always look for the freebies, even though this information I'm giving you is complimentary. So, but in, in, in this case, you want to make sure that you're investing not only in your future, but for that peace of mind. So let's go ahead and jump into some of this life-changing information. <clears throat> All right. So what makes up a credit score? All right. So what makes up a credit score? There's a couple different components. Okay. Now, I'm going to go in sequential order based upon the, the, the importance because just knowing these five components, you can literally instantly improve your credit score overnight. You know, I look at thousands of credit reports a month. And one of the things that, you know, is a common you know, question is that how do I increase my credit? And again, it's the lack of information. But then once you get the information, you want to make sure that you apply it. So hopefully that hopefully you apply everything that you're about to learn here. So the first thing is payment history. Your payment history is extremely important. Understanding payment history is 35% of your score. 35% of what makes up your credit score. This is the largest component of what makes up your credit score. Now, you may ask, what's payment history? It's the ability to make payments on time. Meaning, you get a credit card, you have a, a, an automobile, you have your mortgage, or whatever the case is, you have to make your payments on time every single month. One late payment, meaning a 30-day late, can drop a score 50 to 100 points. So that can be the difference from going from a 700 to a 600, literally overnight, because life happened. We understand life does happen in relation to dealing with your credit. Because you're on vacation, you're at a, a wedding or whatever the case is, and you forget to send in that $15 credit card payment to your credit card company. Next thing you know, it's a 30 days past due, and then your score just dropped, and you don't know why. Or you may be one who didn't believe in having access to credit monitoring, and you didn't even know your score dropped. So again, it's vitally important because this can be corrected. You know, So one of the things that you can do if you did get a late payment is... The power of the goodwill letter. Basically, a goodwill letter is, in layman's terms, you're reaching out to the company and asking in good faith 
Are they willing to reverse this 30-day late payment for you? And if so, that score will go back up to, uh, or you will see an, uh, an increase in your score. Now, it may not go back to the original score, but if it went back and it, it, you, know, you were shy seven points, you're still winning. So that's the thing that I really want you to look at. Now, also understand, in relation to that goodwill letter, now, if you got seven, eight, nine, ten plus late payments on that one account, the odds on getting those removed are pretty slim to none. So this is mainly used in the event if, you know, life happened, you had a slip up. So understanding payment history, vitally important. Next is your credit usage. Now, credit usage, 30% of your credit score. Now, when I saw this, again, this information changed my life. When I saw this information right here, just these two components, I was like, man, this is the two biggest challenges on my credit report. I had a bunch of late payments and my credit usage was out of whack. What is credit usage? So credit usage or credit utilization, or what is also commonly referred to is, and let's draw this out for you. You know, I'm a visual person. So let's say you have a credit card for $1,000, okay? You use $800 of it. Your credit utilization is 80% of that $1,000. Now, your credit usage or credit utilization is only based off of revolving credit. So you may ask, what's revolving credit? Okay, again, this is, this is life-changing information So, because a lot of people don't know the difference between the types of credit. You have revolving, and then you have installment. All right, revolving would be credit cards, department store cards, uh, or anything that has a revolving balance. Installments would be an auto loan, your home loan, your student loans. Anything that generally has a fixed payment is going to be an installment. So from a credit utilization standpoint, it's only going to be based off of revolving credit. Hence, if you only have $1,000 worth of revolving credit and you use $800 of it, you are at 80%. Now, Credit utilization being 30% of our credit score, you also want to understand, or I don't think it's a coincidence, that you never want your credit utilization to exceed 30%. Okay? Meaning 30% of this thousand dollars is three hundred dollars. So for what for so for everyone out there who has credit cards, what I want you to do is factor and figure out and calculate how much revolving credit you actually have reporting and divide it by three. That's what your credit limit actually should be. Now, there are some circumstances, yeah, you're going to exceed 30%, but understand that now you know how to play the game properly, understanding that, okay, if I go over 30%, my score is going to decrease, but at least now you have the information and know what to do to get it back under the 30% so that your score can go back up. So now, one of the biggest things that I see with people or my, or my people who say, you know what, I don't like credit cards. Because again, this is based off of strictly revolving credit, which mostly is credit cards, because a department store card is also in the family of a credit card. So for those people who don't believe in credit, you know, again, Big Mama told us credit was bad, <laughs> or whatever the case is, and you have a $500 secured credit card, and that's all you have, okay? Now, some of these secured credit cards, not all, when they first send you the card, they take fees out immediately. Or it may not be a secured card. And if you don't know what a secured credit card is, it's when you put your money into almost like a savings account and they give you a credit card for that amount of money that you put into the, to their bank, which generally most people start with about a $500 secured credit card. Now for some of those, what we call uh, C and D tiered credit cards, generally people who are rebuilding their credit, you may get approved for a three to $500 credit card then they're going to take out all of their fees. And by the time you get that credit card, you have $100 on that card because they may have taken $400 in fees. So what just happened? Your utilization just decreased 90%. Again, what you don't know can hurt you. So now that you know, or as they say, when you know better, you do better. So we're going to help you do better in understanding why you want to have access to credit because life happens. Going back to this scenario, you have $1,000 worth of credit, life happens. 
your brakes go out, you have to get the kids braces or whatever the case is. Credit is that emergency lifeline because some people don't have an extra $800 laying around in cash. They say the average family has $500 in their savings account. Now, again, I'm not saying credit is to be used as cash. Again, it's a form of leverage. But in this scenario, because we understand that life can happen, if you have access to credit, you're able to make sure that life continue on without skipping a beat. So and again, in this scenario, you have an $800 scenario or $800 situation. Your credit score just dropped just for doing what you have to do anyway. So that's why I always tell people, you want to at minimum have access to $10,000 worth of revolving credit. Because then if life happens and you have that $800 you know, uh, situation, now you're only at 8%. Guess what happened? It didn't affect your credit score. So understanding that having access to credit is the, first of all, the quickest way for you to build your credit score, to have the perfect credit score. And when you're going out there trying to apply for things, banks gauge and in, 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 in underwrite your application based upon the amount of credit you have. You know, so if you're trying to buy, you know, that first, you know, uh, home residency for you and your family and the dog and two kids and have the white picket fence, you know, the story that they sold us when we were growing up in school uh, and, you, and that home is, let's say, uh, a quarter of a million dollars. You know, that's probably about the average uh, selling price for a home across the country. Now, if all you have is a thousand dollars worth of credit, why would a bank want to give you two hundred and fifty thousand dollars towards that property? You need to be able to show them that you are credit worthy. So that's why another reason why having access to credit helps to position you from a credit profile standpoint. That's one of the things I really also want to get past you. Understand, it's not about the credit score. I talk to people every single day. Hey, I want an 800 credit score. Well, 800 doesn't mean anything. It's about the information that's in there. And again, that very information is exactly what I'm giving you guys right here, right now. So Definitely hope you guys are still locked in with me. So if you notice, you know, those two things, again, are the largest component. These two, these two situations or these two components of how to get the perfect credit score today make up 65%. Let me write this down. I really want you guys to, to see this, the power of this. 65% of our credit score are just the two tricks or tips or bits of information that I gave you just right here, just right now. Now, if all you did was focused on those two things, literally you can improve your credit score within the next 30 to 45 days. No magical information, no magical pill, I should say, no Kool-Aid to drink, but with information, information that they've kept away from us. You know, I can remember being in, in, in college. Uh, I did, you know, two years in college. And so I can remember being in my economics class and asking my teacher, because he brought up a point of something about, you know, he had several failed businesses and he gave up and now that's why he's a college professor. So I remember raising my hand and I said, Mr. So-and-so, so you can't teach me to be wealthy. And he said, well, I don't think I can do that. And I dropped out of college. <laughs> you know, I wanted to follow people who were successful. And at that time, my professor was not successful. But I guarantee you, if he had information like this, he wouldn't have felt that way because he felt broken. Maybe he felt, you know, you know, he couldn't get access to some capital to continue his business. Usually the number one reason most businesses close is they're undercapitalized. And if you remember at the beginning of this, I mentioned your credit is the lifeline of your business. That's why you can have wealthy, successful business owners and entrepreneurs who filed bankruptcy multiple times, but they don't miss a beat because they understand this information. Again, information that we hadn't been taught. And I remember in my economics class, there was no chapter or section about credit. There was no chapter or section about finances. It just gave us theory. It talked about stocks and how the stock market created and the Great Depression and all those things that gave me no benefit of what I'm doing right now. So 65% of what makes up our credit score is what we just covered. Okay, so a couple different things. Uh, new credit. One of the next components of how to get the perfect credit score is you got to get new credit. I talk to people all the time. They say, Will, how do I increase my credit score? You got to get access to new credit. 
Now I get it. It's good. It could be a catch 22. Well, how can I get new credit if my credit is bad? Understand that's why you want to seek out mentors. You want to have someone who's a, a expert. Uh, that's why you're here getting this information. So now you can become an expert. You position yourself with the knowledge to be the expert, of course, at least within your immediate circle. So getting access to new credit is the fastest way to increase your credit score. Understanding there's a couple different ways to increase your credit. Yes, you can get secure credit cards. All right. You can get uh, uh, unsecured credit cards. Oops. Now, basically the difference between secured and unsecured credit cards, secured credit cards, again, as mentioned, that's when you're putting your money into a bank and they're going to give you a line of credit on that credit card based upon that dollar amount. Unsecured means that they, based upon your credit profile, your debt to income ratio, and all of those different things, they're going to give you a line of credit that you have to pay back every single month. But no matter which one you go with, keep in mind, you want to make sure that you keep your payments on time. All right. Another thing you can do is using authorized users. All right. You may ask, well, what's an authorized user? There's a couple different terminologies out there for it. You have trade lines, you have piggybacking, which is the old mortgage term. But authorized users can be a very effective way to increase your credit scores literally within the next 30 to 45 days. How do you get access to an authorized user? Essentially what it is, is you have a family member, a friend, a coworker, whoever, someone obviously who has to trust you, who has good credit, um, and they have a credit card and good standings. So what happens is, is they can call their bank, their institution, their financial uh, uh, lender, and ask them to add you on as an authorized user to that credit card. Now, you don't get the credit card, you know, if that's what you're thinking, or for those who are saying, you know what, I was thinking about doing this for a friend or relative or whatever. I don't want them to have access to the card. You can tell the institution, no, I don't want a card mailed out or have it shipped to your home address, the person who the credit line actually belongs to. And what happens is, is that all that information on that credit card that's been in good standings for the past X amount of years now goes on to your credit file. So now it took you from having only that $1,000 credit card line and someone with a $10,000 credit card line adds you as an authorized user. Now you have over $11,000 of revolving credit. Again, instantly boosting your credit score depending on where your utilization was at, but then also put, giving you a stronger credit profile. Again, what banks look at, they look at credit profiles. So now, a couple caveats with authorized users. One, you want to make sure they have no late payments. All right. Secondly, you want to make sure that they're at 10% balance of the card. Okay? The reason being at a 10% balance is important is because if they're at 30%, and let's say you're already over 30% based upon the uh, accounts that are actually reporting on your profile that are yours, it's going to throw your utilization out of whack and it pretty much did nothing for you. You know, I had a scenario where uh, I had a client who asked his father to add him on as an authorized user. He called me. He was really excited and said, well, my dad has a credit card, $15,000. It's uh, about 25 years old. And I said, great. What's the limit? What's the balance on it? He said $14,999.76. <laughs> so I quickly told him that would not be a great idea because that credit card was maxed out at a 99% credit utilization. If he would have added that, guess what would have happened? His credit score would have plummeted. But again, he wouldn't have known that if he hadn't had access to this information. And I see people make that mistake. Com I see people make that mistake all the time. They assume just because someone has a high credit card limit that it's going to help their credit score. But keep in mind, if it doesn't fit in the criteria where they don't have any lates and the balance is less than 10 percent, you pretty much did yourself a disservice. And sometimes fighting with the credit bureaus, it can be a headache trying to get those things removed off the credit report. It's almost like you have to prove to them that this is not mine, even though it's not yours. <laughs> so, so yeah, so authorized users definitely can be used as a benefit, but understanding how to use them effectively is extremely important, okay? So, next thing, credit mix or mix of credit. What is mix of credit? Your mix of credit is all of the things that you can apply for that make up your credit profile. So you have your, your auto loan, you have your home or mortgage, 
You have your revolving credit. You may have a personal loan. You may have student loans. You may have, you know, a, um, let's see, uh, in some cities, in some states, they actually report your utility bills. So utility bills. All these things can report on your credit report and would be a mix of your credit. Now, understand, if all you had was revolving credit, meaning only credit cards reporting, your credit profile is not that effective. I'll give you an example. Did you know there are three different credit scoring models based upon what you're trying to get approved for? That, this is what this looks like. When you go to buy a home, there's a credit scoring model that they use to calculate your credit score specifically to purchase a home. When you go and buy a car, there's a credit score. Your FICO score gauges differently based upon your auto loan score, as I call it. Meaning, you can have a 750 plus credit score, but if you've never uh, financed an automobile, they can cap you on how much of a vehicle they're going to loan you or how much money they loan you for a vehicle. Usually it caps out right around about 15 to 20 uh, plus thousand dollars. So now you can have a 690 credit score, but let's say you've financed two different vehicles over the, 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 the life of your credit profile and you had great payment history, you will get sometimes a better rate and be approved for more money for that auto loan even though you have a 690 and the other person has a 750. So understand how your credit scores based upon what you're trying to apply for is going to, you know, gauge a little bit differently. Lastly, of course, you have your credit cards and revolving credit. They have a different, you know, algorithm of how they gauge your credit profile. And did you know you can have a 790 credit score and not get approved for a credit card? Again, because your credit profile, your mixture of credit makes a huge difference and whether they want to borrow money to you. Because again, the reason it's harder to get approved for a credit card versus an automobile or a home is that these are hard assets. So if you stop making payments, what can they do? They come and take the house <laughs> and take the car. But with the credit card, banks have to protect their interest some kind of way because they can't come back and take something. Now, of course, they can cut you off with your credit line, but by that point, you went and probably squandered the credit line. So you know, one of the things that banks do is they, you know, scrutinize your credit report to make sure, okay, this person is credit worthiness or they have enough credit worthiness for me to extend them this $5,000 line of credit or this $5,000 credit card. So what they do is they look at a couple of different variables from a standpoint when you're trying to get an approval for a credit card. Of course, they're looking at your mixture of credit. But then they also look at your high limits of your credits, your, your balances of your credits, how often you carry a balance. Uh, they even want to look at how old your credit profile history is. Let's say you just started being approved for revolving credit in the past two years. It may not weigh as heavily as someone who's been utilizing revolving credit for the past 10 years. So all those things you know, go into play when getting an approval. But as we talked about in this particular scenario, it's all about the mixture of your credit. It's vitally important because again, having a strong credit profile is how you go out there and, and, and unlock, as I call it, the bank's money. It's how you go out there and, and, and leverage your credit. Okay. So <clears throat> one of the very last ingredients about what it's going to take for you to build a perfect credit score, it's actually kind of covered in one of the first topics, but it's the length of your credit history. Length of credit. All right. And you may say, what do you mean by the length of credit? All of our credit profiles has an uh, age of time, meaning th from the very first time you had credit extended to you, that's when that clock starts. And then it goes on infinitely until, you know, you decide you no longer want to apply for credit. So now keep in mind, the newer your file, meaning let's say you just started building credit in the past two years your scores or your profile may be a little bit weaker than someone who's had a 10 year credit history run, as I call it. So the length of credit is vitally important. Now, you may also say, well, what do you mean by the length of credit? Or how, how does that hurt me or help me or whatever the case is? I'll give you an example. So let's say you have 10 years of credit history. 
And then you say, you know what? It's time for me to go out there and start building some new credit. But your credit is not in position, you know, understanding. It's a difference when you're trying to apply for credit when it's in position versus when it's not in position. So when it's not in position and your credit file is 10 years old, and you're going out there and applying for a bunch of credit cards and you're getting nothing but denials, what's going to happen is you're going to get what's called credit inquiries, meaning every time they pull your credit or check your credit, it's going to be like a, a, a demerit on your credit profile, letting the banks know, hey, this person has tried to apply for credit. But when you get denied, it's that much more detrimental to your overall credit profile. But hence, what it also does is that it brings your length of credit history down. Let's say you do get approved for that $300 credit card. So what's going to happen is it brought your average age of your file down. So it's really important to understand, first of all, the length of credit history is important, but also that you know you want to make sure that you're not just going out there going on a credit card binge. You want to make sure that, first of all, you've educated yourself on what banks and underwriters are looking for to even be approved. And then I also see this happen a lot when people are going out there automobile shopping. Did you know you can get an automobile with a 500 credit score? Now, I didn't say a good automobile. <laughs> so you can get an automobile with a 500 credit score, but what comes along with that 500 credit score automobile that you just drove off? 29% interest, which means for a $10,000 vehicle that you probably had to put down $7,000 on, the remaining balance of $3,000, your monthly payment is going to be $280 over the next three years. Now, you can do the math on that and see you just pay for this vehicle probably about four times over. So understand that when you don't have bad credit, having bad credit is expensive. I'll just flat out tell you. But with this information, again, that's done wonders for my life, has been able to position me to travel the country. You know, uh, I was fortunate enough to do a 25 city tour with my partner last year to where, where we went into communities and literally, the exact same thing I'm doing right here on this whiteboard, we were able to do for them outside, whether it was raining, uh, whether it was you know 90 degrees and humid, you know any weather condition you could think of, of course, because we crisscrossed the country over the span of about nine months. And we gave people this information. And, 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 and I literally would have people come up to me in tears and say, you just don't know that you know how much this information has changed me because now we've been able to go from a two-bedroom apartment where seven of us are living to be able to purchase our first home. And I mean, things like that is what pushes me to continue on, on this quest of giving you this information. Again, that's been so vital to me and that's helped me, uh, you know, tremendously over the past 10 years. Again, guys, this is Will Roundtree. And, and, and again, this is why I made this program. You know, uh, I wanted to give you guys this information not just so that you can hoard it for yourself, but so that you can actually do something with it. You know, so when you are sick and tired of being sick and tired, when you're constantly getting those, you know, credit card denials, when you're constantly having collection agencies call your phone, whether you're at home or you're at work, you know, whether you're, you, you're scared to go to the car dealership because you know you're going to roll out of there with something that's undesirable based upon your credit score. Or you may be one of those who know nothing about credit. That's okay. Because we have something no matter where you at. So, you know, I'm going to provide you a link somewhere. I'm not sure it's going to be up here or down here or whatever. But I just want to make sure that you take advantage of this information today. You know, they said it's no better time than the present. So, you know, take charge today, you know, and get this information and go ahead and set yourself to, 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 to like I say, open up different doors. You know, uh, one of the things that I learned is that when you have a, a strong credit score, you walk differently. So why not put yourself in position to walk into that dealership more confidently? Walk to the closing table uh, when you're getting ready to purchase your first home a little bit more confident. Position your kids to be able to go off to college with strong credit scores. Just giving them more financial astuteness and, 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 and helping them excel when they're already getting ready to go to college. And if you give this information to them before they go to college, I'm telling you, they'll be light years ahead of most people there and probably even most of the professors. So again, get enrolled today. Click the link below or up top <laughs> or on the side. I'm not sure where it's going to be. And, and, and let's get started. And I'll see you at the top. <laughs>